Hello and welcome to MBKM Models, please don't forget to like, share, subscribe and follow for more aircraft documentaries and model build videos. I left Hartcliffe School after growing up on the Knoll Social Housing Estate in Bristol without many formal qualifications at 15 years old and gained an apprenticeship at Rolls-Royce Bristol Aero Engine Division where I completed my first year of broad-based engineering training at Rolls-Royce's own college at Filton in Bristol. In my second year because of scoring to my surprise above average marks for hand skills I specialized in sheet metal fitting. During this time I worked and trained on RB199GR1 Tornado and Pegasus Harrier jump jet engines. After completing my apprenticeship I later worked in aircraft plastics as a fitter and inspector and also at British Aerospace as an aircraft fitter and inspector. At PAE I worked on A320 wings then on Vickers VC-10 aircraft. During the time of my apprenticeship and just after, I joined and served in the British Army Reserve. I had just completed three years in the Army Cadet Force at 16 years old so at 17 years and 2 weeks old I joined as a boy soldier in 266 Observation Post Battery of the Royal Artillery in Bristol where I served for 5 years as a gunner later non-commissioned officer. My employment trade in the Royal Artillery was as a driver operator. I completed a 6 month course at 18 years old to become a radio operator. In 5 years I went through the complete system of the regiment, first starting as a gun crew number 2 on 25 pounder field guns then later as an officer's signaller on no peas. At Rolls Royce during my apprenticeship I was given 2 weeks extra holiday. One week paid another unpaid for military service once a year. This was brokered in a union agreement by the Amalgamated Union of Engineering Workers now part of UNITE. In my time at both factories I was a union member, first holding a Red Boys membership card then later the well-known green card for skilled workers which I was proud of. From my early part of life up to 30 years old I am still very proud of my Union Green Card and Royal Artillery Regimental Signalers Flags trade badge I was given during this period. When I was 13 years old my dad asked me what I wanted to do for work when I left school. Ian Dury and the Blockheads what a waste was in the charts in this year which at the time was assisting me for picking work. I told my dad who was ex-regular army and a union shop steward that I wanted to be a mercenary in Africa because I saw this on the news and it looked good. His reply with laughter and a smile on his face was that you can't do that at 15 years old and you also have not served in the parachute regiment. I remember he told me that if you were captured as a mercenary you would receive the death penalty for the crime of the attempted overthrow of the government of someone else's country. This put me off a bit, some time after this a British mercenary who was ex-parachute regiment was executed in Angola for this crime, British television news interviewed him just before he was executed. His comment that he was issued with webbing that kids could buy in a shop hit hard on me and drove my dad's advice hard into my mind. My dad then steered me towards the army cadets and an apprenticeship at Rolls Royce where he worked. At 17 years old my dad told me to join the army reserve. Reasons to be cheerful. Part 3 hit the UK charts in 1979. I gained my first of one or two girlfriends over the years in this year and never looked back. The Bristol Aeroplane Company, originally the British and Colonial Aeroplane Company, was both one of the first and one of the most important British aviation companies, designing and manufacturing both airframes and aircraft engines. Notable aircraft produced by the company include the Box Kite, the Bristol Fighter, the Bulldog, the Blenheim, the Bowfighter, and the Britannia, and much of the preliminary work which led to Concorde was carried out by the company. In 1956 its major operations were split into Bristol Aircraft and Bristol Aero Engines. In 1959, Bristol Aircraft merged with several major British aircraft companies to form the British Aircraft Corporation BAC and Bristol Aero Engines merged with Armstrong Sidley to form Bristol Sidley. BAC went on to become a founding component of the nationalised British Aerospace, 
now BAE Systems, Bristol Sidley was purchased by Rolls-Royce in 1966, who continued to develop and market Bristol-designed engines. The BAC works were in Filton, about 4 miles 6a kilometres north of Bristol city centre. BAE Systems, Airbus, Rolls-Royce. MBDA and GKN still have a presence at the Filton site where the Bristol Aeroplane Company was located. The British and Colonial Aeroplane Company was founded in February 1910 by Sir George White, chairman of the Bristol Tramways and Carriage Company, along with his son Stanley and his brother Samuel, to commercially exploit the fast-growing aviation sector. Sir George had been inspired to embark on this venture following a chance meeting between himself and American aviation pioneer Wilbur Wright in France during 1909, after which he recognized aviation as holding significant business potential. Unlike the majority of aviation companies of the era, which were typically started by enthusiasts with little financial backing or business ability. British and Colonial was from its outset well funded and run by experienced businessmen. Sir George had decided to establish the business as a separate company from the Bristol Tramway Company, having considered that such a venture would be seen as too risky by many shareholders, and the new company's working capital of £25,000 was subscribed entirely by Sir George, his brother, and his son. The affairs of the two companies were closely connected, and the company's first premises were a pair of former tram sheds suitable for aircraft manufacture at Filton, leased from the Bristol Tramway Company. Additionally, key personnel for the new business were recruited from the employees of the Tramway Company, such as George Challenger, who served as the company's chief engineer and works manager. Flying schools were established at Brooklands in Surrey which was then the centre of activity for British aviation, where Bristol rented a hangar and at Lark Hill on Salisbury Plain where, in June 1910, a school was established on 2,248 acres 9.10 a kilometres square of land leased from the war office. These flying schools came to be regarded as some of the best in the world, and by 1914, 308 of the 664 Royal Aero Club certificates which had been issued had been gained at the company's schools. The company's initial manufacturing venture was to be a licensed and improved version of an aircraft manufactured in France by the Zodiac Society, a biplane designed by Gabriel Voisin. This aircraft had been exhibited at the Paris Aero Salon in 1909 and had impressed Sir George with the quality of its construction. Accordingly, a single example was purchased and shipped to England to be shown at the Aero Show at Olympia in March 1910, and construction of five further aircraft commenced at the company's Filton facilities. It was then transported to Brooklands for flight trials, where it immediately became apparent that the type had an unsatisfactory wing section and lacked sufficient power in spite of high expectations, even though Bristol fitted the aircraft with a new set of wings. It could only manage a single brief hop on the 28th of May 1910, after which work on the project was abandoned. Since the machine had been sold with a guarantee to fly, Sir George succeeded in getting 15,000 francs compensation from Zodiac. In light of this failure, the company decided to embark upon designing its own aircraft to serve as a successor. Drawings were prepared by George Challenger for an aircraft based on a successful design by Henri Farman whose dimensions had been published in the Aeronautical Press. These drawings were produced in little over a week, and Sir George promptly authorized the construction of 20 examples. The first aircraft to be completed was taken to Lark Hill for flight trials, where it performed its first flight on 20 July 1910, piloted by Morris Edmonds. The aircraft proved entirely satisfactory during flight tests. The first batch equipped the two training schools, as well as serving as demonstration machines the aircraft, which gained the nickname of the Box Kite went on to become a commercial success, a total of 76 being constructed. Many served in the company's flying schools and examples were sold to the war office as well as a number of foreign governments. 
Although satisfactory by the standards of the day, the box kite was not capable of much further development and work soon was started on two new designs, a small tractor configuration by plane and a monoplane, both of these were exhibited at the 1911 Aero Show at Olympia but neither was flown successfully, at this time, both Challenger and Lowe left the company to join the newly established aircraft division of the armament firm Vickers, their place was taken by Pierre Pryor, the former chief instructor at the Blair E.O. Flying School at Hendon, he was later joined by Gordon England, in January 1912, Romanian aircraft engineer Henri C.O. and there was appointed as the company's chief designer, during early 1912, a highly secret separate design office, known as the X Department, was set up to work on Deniston Burney's ideas for naval aircraft. Frank Barnwell was taken on as the design engineer for this project, and took over as Bristol's chief designer when CO and left the company in October 1914. Barnwell was to become one of the world's foremost aeronautical engineers, and was to work for the company until his death in 1938. The company expanded rapidly, establishing a second factory at the Brislington Tramway Works. The firm employed a total of 200 people by the outbreak of the First World War. At the outbreak of war in August 1914, Britain's military forces possessed just over a hundred aircraft and the Royal Flying Corps consisted of only seven squadrons equipped with a miscellany of aircraft types, none of them armed. Official War Office policy was to purchase only aircraft designed by the Royal Aircraft Establishment and Bristol had already built a number of their BE-2, two-seater reconnaissance aircraft, however, pressure from the pilots of the RFC and Royal Naval Air Service led to orders being placed for a new aircraft manufactured by Bristol known as the Scout, in 1915, Barnwell returned from France, his skills as pilot being considered to be of much less value than his ability as a designer, at this time Leslie Fries, newly graduated from Bristol University's engineering department, was recruited by Barnwell. In 1916, the company's founder Sir George died he was succeeded in managing the company by his son Stanley. The first project that was worked on by Barnwell after his return, the Bristol TTA, was designed in response to a war office requirement for a two-seat fighter intended to conduct home defense operations against Zeppelin raids. This was not successful but, in 1916, work was started on the Bristol F-2A, which was developed into the highly successful F-2B fighter, one of the outstanding aircraft of the 1914-18 war and a mainstay of the RAF during the 1920s. More than 5,300 of the type were produced and the fighter remained in service until 1931. Another aircraft designed at this time was the Bristol Monoplane Scout. Although popular with pilots, the success of this aircraft was limited by war office prejudice against monoplanes and only 130 were built. It was considered that its relatively high landing speed of 50 a miles per hour made it unsuitable for use under the field conditions of the Western Front, and the type's active service was limited to the Near East. By the end of the war, the company employed over 3,000 at its production works, which was split between Filton and Brislington. Its products had always been referred to by the name Bristol and this was formalized in 1920 when British and Colonial was liquidated and its assets transferred to the Bristol Aeroplane Company, during this time the company, acting under pressure from the Air Ministry, bought the Aero Engine Division of the bankrupt Cosmos Engineering Company, based in the Bristol suburb of Fishponds, to form the nucleus of a new Aero Engine operation. There was already a good working relationship between Bristol Aircraft and Cosmos, the Cosmos Jupiter having been first flown in a prototype Bristol Badger in May 1919, for £15,000 Bristol got the Cosmos design team, headed by Roy Fedden, along with a small number of completed engines and tooling, although it was to be several years before Bristol showed any profit from the aero engine division, the Jupiter engine eventually proved enormously successful indeed, during the interwar period, 
the aero engine division was more successful than the parent company and Bristol came to dominate the market for air-cooled radial engines. Apart from providing engines for almost all Bristol's aircraft designs, the Jupiter and its successors powered an enormous number of aircraft built by other manufacturers. Bristol's most successful aircraft during this period was the Bristol Bulldog Fighter which formed the mainstay of Royal Air Force Fighter Force between 1930 and 1937, when the Bulldog was retired from frontline service. Since the Bulldog had started life as a private venture rather than an Air Ministry-sponsored prototype it could be sold to other countries, and Bulldogs were exported to, among others, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, and Australia. During this time, Bristol was noted for its preference for steel airframes, using members built up from high tensile steel strip rolled into flanged sections rather than the light alloys more generally used in aircraft construction. On 15 June 1935, the Bristol Aeroplane Company became a public limited company. By this time, the company had a payroll of 4,200, mostly in the engine factory and was well positioned to take advantage of the huge rearmament ordered by the British government in May of that year. Bristol's most important contribution to the expansion of the RAF at this time was the Blenheim light bomber. In August 1938, Frank Barnwell was killed flying a light aircraft of his own design. Barnwell was succeeded as Bristol's chief designer by Leslie Fries. By the time war broke out in 1939, the Bristol works at Filton were the largest single aircraft manufacturing unit in the world, with a floor area of nearly 25 hectares. During the Second World War, Bristol's most important aircraft was the Bowfighter heavy two seat multi role aircraft, a long range fighter, night fighter, ground attack aircraft, and torpedo bomber. The type was used extensively by the RAF. Other Commonwealth Air Forces and by the USAAF the Bow Fighter was derived from the Beaufort Torpedo Bomber, itself a derivative of the Blenheim. In 1940, shadow factories were set up at Western Supermare for the production of Bow Fighters, and underground at Hawthorne, near Corsham, Wiltshire, for engine manufacture. Construction in the former stone quarry at Hawthorne took longer than expected and little production was achieved before the site closed in 1945. The company's wartime headquarters was located in the Royal West of England Academy, Clifton, Bristol. In 1960, Sir George White was instrumental in preventing the car division being lost during the wider company's merger with BAC. Accordingly Bristol Cars Limited was formed and remained within the Filton complex. Sir George retired in 1973 and Tony Crook purchased his share, becoming sole proprietor and managing director. Prefabricated buildings, marine craft and plastic and composite materials were also amongst the company's early post-war activities. These side ventures were independently sold off. Bristol was involved in the post-war renaissance of British civilian aircraft, which was largely inspired by the Brabers and Committee Report of 1943-5. In 1949, the Brabers and Airliner prototype, at the time one of the largest aircraft in the world, first flew. This project was deemed to be a step in the wrong direction, gaining little interest from military or civilian operators, resulting in the Brabers and being ultimately cancelled in 1953. At the same time as the termination, Bristol decided to focus on development of a large turboprop-powered airliner, known as the Britannia, capable of traversing transatlantic routes. It proved a commercial success both it and the freighter were produced in quantity during the 1950s. However, sales of the Britannia were poor and only 82 were built primarily due to its protracted development having been ordered by BOAC on 28 July 1949 and first flown on 16 August 1952, it did not enter service until 1 February 1957. Bristol was also involved in helicopter development, with the Belvedere and Sycamore going into quantity production. Another post-war activity was missile development culminating in the production of the Bloodhound anti-aircraft missile which became an Airfix plastic model kit. Upon introduction, 
the Bloodhound was the RAF's only long-range transportable surface-to-air missile. Bristol Aero engines produced a range of rocket motors and ramjets for missile propulsion. The Guided Weapons Division eventually became part of Maitre BAE Dynamic Sail and UMBDA. In the late 1950s, the company undertook supersonic transport SST project studies, the Type 223, which were later to contribute to Concorde. A research aircraft, the Type 188, was constructed in the 1950s to test the feasibility of stainless steel as a material in a Mach 2.0 airframe. By the time the aircraft flew in 1962, the company was already part of BAC in parallel with these supersonic studies. Several subsonic designs were schemed in this period, including the Type 200 a competitor of the Hawker Sidele Trident and its derivatives, the Type 201 and Type 205. None of these designs were built. In 1959, Bristol was forced by government policy to merge its aircraft interests with English Electric, Hunting Aircraft and Vickers Armstrongs to form the British Aircraft Corporation. Bristol formed a holding company which held a 20% share of BAC, while English Electric and Vickers held 40% each. In 1966, the Bristol Holding Company which held 20% of BAC and 50% of Bristol Sidelli engines was acquired by Rolls-Royce. Bristol also had the following holdings and subsidiary companies at this time. Bristol Aerojet 50%, Bristol Aeroplane Company Australia, Bristol de Mexico SA 78%, Motors Bristol D Cube SA, Bristol Aeroplane Company of Canada, Bristol Aero Industries Limited. Bristol Aeroplane Company USA, Spartan Air Services Limited 46.5%, Bristol Aeroplane Company New Zealand, Bristol Aircraft Services Limited, Bristol Aeroplane Plastics Limited, SECA 30%, Short Brothers and Harland 15.25%, Svansk Aero Service ABTABS 25%, Westland Aircraft Limited 10%. The Canadian Bristol Group of Companies was the largest of the overseas subsidiaries. The group undertook aircraft handling and servicing at Dorval Airport, Montreal. Vancouver Airport was the base for Bristol Aero Engines Western, one of the Canadian company's four operating subsidiaries. Work at Vancouver included the overhaul of Pratt and Whitney and Wright engines for the RCAF and commercial operators. Bristol Aircraft Western, Limited Stevenson Field, Winnipeg was formerly McDonald Brothers Aircraft, and was the largest of the subsidiaries and the group's only airframe plant. Bristol D. Mexico, SADCV Central Airport, Mexico City, overhauled piston engines for South American operators. Bristol D. Mexico SA obtained a license to manufacture Alfred Herbert Limited machine tools in 1963 and commenced assembling their center lathes in 1963. They also commenced building their own design of small engine lathes for the Mexican government to be installed in training schools throughout Mexico. Malcolm Roebuck was hired from Alfred Herbert Limited along with William Walford Webb Woodward to supervise this project. In 1977, BAC was nationalised, along with Scottish Aviation and Hawker Sidelli, to form British Aerospace, which later became part of the now privatised BAE Systems. The Canadian unit was acquired by Rolls-Royce Holdings and sold in 1997 to current owner Magellan Aerospace. The Bristol Engine Company was originally a separate entity, Cosmos Engineering formed from the pre-First World War automobile company Brazil Straker. In 1917, Cosmos was asked to investigate air-cooled radial engines and under Roy Fedden, produced what became the Cosmos Mercury, a 14-cylinder two-row helical radial, which they launched in 1918. This engine saw little use but the simpler nine-cylinder version known as the Bristol Jupiter was clearly a winning design. With the post-war apid contraction of military orders, 
Cosmos Engineering went bankrupt and the Air Ministry let it be known that it would be a good idea if the Bristol Aeroplane Company purchased it. The Jupiter competed with the Armstrong Sidelli Jaguar through the 1920s but Bristol put more effort into their design and by 1929, the Jupiter was clearly superior. In the 1930s and led by Roy Fedden, the company developed the new Bristol Perseus line of radials based on the sleeve valve principle which developed into some of the most powerful piston engines in the world and continued to be sold into the 1960s. In 1956, the division was renamed Bristol Aero Engines and then merged with Armstrong Sidelli in 1958 to form Bristol Sidelli as a counterpart of the airframe producing company mergers that formed back. Bristol retained a 50% share of the new company with Hawker Sidelli Group holding the other 50%. In 1966, Bristol Sidelli was purchased by Rolls-Royce, leaving the latter as the only major aero engine company in Britain. From 1967, Bristol Sidelli's operations became the Bristol Engine Division and the Small Engine Division of Rolls-Royce, identified separately from Rolls-Royce's existing aero engine division. A number of Bristol Sidelli engines continued to be developed under Rolls-Royce including the Olympus turbojet including the joint development Bristol started with Snickma for Concorde and the Pegasus, the astronomical names favoured by Bristol indicated their heritage in a Rolls-Royce lineup named after British rivers. The Bristol Aeroplane Company's helicopter division had its roots in 1944, when the helicopter designer Raoul Hafner, released from the Airborne Forces Experimental Establishment, came to Bristol along with some members of his team. Under Hafner's direction, the division produced two successful designs that were sold in quantity. The first, designated the Type 171, had a shaky start after the wooden rotor blades of the second prototype failed on its first flight in 1949. Nevertheless, the Type 171, called Sycamore in military service was sold to air forces around the world and 178 were built in total. After the Type 171, the Bristol Helicopter Division started work on a tandem rotor civil helicopter. The result was the 13-seat Type 173, which made its first flight in Filton in 1952. Five examples were built for evaluation purposes. Although no airlines ordered the Type 173, it led to military designs, of which the Type 192 went into service with the RAF as the Belvedere. First flying in 1958, 26 were built in total. Pursuing the idea of a civil tandem rotor helicopter, Hafner and his team developed a much larger design, the Type 194. This was in an advanced state of design when the Bristol Helicopter Division was merged, as a result of government influence, with the helicopter interests of other British aircraft manufacturers Westland, Ferry and Saunders wrote to form Westland Helicopters in 1960. When the competing Westland Westminster was cancelled, the management of the combined company allowed development of the Type 194 to continue but it too failed to find a market. The helicopter division started out at the main Bristol Aeroplane Company site in Filton, but from 1955 it was moved to the old Mixon factory in Western Supermare, which had built Blenheims during the war. The factory is now the site of the helicopter museum. Bristol did not systematically assign project type numbers until 1923, starting with the Type 90 Barclay. In that year, they also retrospectively assigned type numbers in chronological order to all projects built or not, from August 1914 onwards. Thus the Scouts A and B did not get a type number but the Scout C did and was the type 1. The final Bristol project, numbered type 225, was an unbuilt 1962 STOL transport. Of these 225 types, 117 were built. This list does not include the unbuilt paper aeroplanes it does include the pre-August 1914 aircraft, management and employee relations were not good at both factories where I worked, 
There was a Christmas party every year at the welfare club where myself and a friend who was a 70s man who sang a selection of Elvis Presley and Tom Jones songs whilst working and claimed he was a welder on a ship that sailed on the Mekong Delta during the Vietnam War used to attend this event where we used to claim our Christmas kisses whilst being fired at with shaving foam from the ladies who worked in the offices. One year we all danced around three abreast in a circle in the main ballroom, this event was stopped by management at Rolls Royce because they said it was immoral, another man I worked with at Rolls Royce who was ex-merchant and Royal Navy, he used to tell me stories about going on the paratrooper ride at Coney Island Fairground in New York in the late 1940s. He also dated the and whilst in North Africa used to get into punch-ups with XSS soldiers who were being deployed by the French Foreign Legion at that time in French Indochina. His description of the soldiers who were FFL machine gun corps with yellow flashes on their uniforms was authenticated when I first came online many years ago. He told me that in any punch-up it was the SS who would kick off first as they couldn't handle the barracking. The best people to be in a punch-up with was the Australians who didn't stop fighting until they collapsed. For their crimes against humanity the SS deserved everything they got from the British and Australians. His advice to me was to fear God and respect my parents and outside of this I could do whatever I wanted. Old Bristolians never die they only fade away. British aerospace was not much different where there were continuous difficulties between employees and management. Like many other companies in the Western world, management would appear to make up the rules as they went along and not adhere to what were laid down union agreements with personnel departments. This then leads to arguments between management and workers. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening and until next time.